Good morning, everyone. Give yourselves a hand for being here today and accept an invitation from God, God to be here. And, you know, every Sunday, every time we, we open up this place, there's a lot of supernatural things happening that will try to stop you from getting here. And we'll do everything it can to get you here. Like, God is doing everything he can to get you here. And there's a devil that will mess up your schedule, get you fighting with everybody in your home, give you sometimes the end of a flat tire, just natural things happening. It's like... Ah, oh, maybe not this Sunday. But I'm so glad that you overcame every one of those obstacles. Not only did he say, yes, I'm coming, but you showed up today. Let's give, you, give yourself a hand for a victory. Do you know, do you know that, that I think at, at times we, are, we can be our worst enemies? Uh, that means that, that we do this. We highlight our shortcomings and we downplay our victories. And what, what ends up happening... You, you start feeling less than, never good enough. And the reason is you're not even looking at life with a real a dose of reality. All you see is like, man, I messed up, I messed up. You might have done good for five days, messed up on one day, and all you're doing is focusing on your mess up. But this, this is what you got to do. is say, you know, I am not my bad day. I am my good days. That's really who I am. And, and I'm going to get right back up because the one that started the work in me, he's going to finish this thing. He, it's, it's his job. He's going to finish it. You know, uh, and it's all a battle, you know, here in our, in our head. And, and, and we got to be careful what conversations we keep playing in our head. Could it be that there's a conversation keeps hitting you that started when you were a kid, when someone told you you're not good enough, you're, you're too this, you're too that, you're a mistake, whatever those things are, be careful that you didn't receive that because, and, and maybe you have, but today you gotta say, I did receive that, but I'm gonna unreceive it. I, I'm gonna get rid of that and I'm gonna start receiving God's love. I'm gonna start receiving, I'm, a, I'm not an accident. I got purpose in my life. My best days are ahead of me. Do you know you'll never have a better future until you start making up your mind? My future is gonna be better than my past. Give the Lord a hand that your future can be better than your past. That God's bigger than your mistakes. So, you know, I, I love when Jesus was on earth. Uh, the, there's a scripture in John 10, 10. I, and he says, the, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I've come to give you a, abundant life. Or I've come to give you a rich and satisfying life. And there's a comparison contrast of this war. That there's actually a thief out there that's trying to steal our life, our family, our dreams, our health, our joy, our peace. He goes, but I've come, and the purpose I've come is to give you a rich and satisfying life. And I, got, I, I want you to understand this. You've come today, but there's also one that has come here today, and he wants to exchange your pain, wants to exchange your failure, wants to exchange your sickness, and he wants to give you his healing, he wants to give you his victory, and he wants to, come on, you come with your addiction, he gives you his freedom. Let's welcome, come on, let's welcome the one that's the answer for all of us. Come on, let's welcome the Holy Spirit. Let's welcome Jesus Christ in this room. And if, if this is your first time here, uh, Life, we're going to be talking about a subject today. Last week we could talk about I'm a soul winner. But today we're going to be talking about I'm, a, I'm an inviter. And, and you, life, is all, this is, life is all about invitations. Uh, things that you, there, there's the invitations that are coming from God, from the good place. And there's invita invitations that are coming from the devil, the bad place. And when God invites you, like today you come into church, it wasn't the devil that invited you, it was God. And, and maybe you say, I don't even want to go to church, but you came, good. You might have been dragged into this place today, but it didn't matter. God's just glad that you came here today. How many understand? Drag, I don't care how you get here, you're here. Some of you guys needed to be dragged, right? And it's only because they love you. But, but, but you got to be careful that you're saying yes to the wrong invitations and saying no to the right invitations because it's all destiny. This week, there's going to be a lot of invitations and you got to be careful. Like, you got to stop and say, oh, invitation. Is this from God or is this from the devil? Do you know the devil's going to give you some invitations this week? Hey, 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 h
Let's go drink. Let's go get high. Let's do this. Let's that. Do that. And some of it's good stuff that replaces should stuff. That means you're doing good stuff, but you're not doing what you should be doing. How many understand that? Even those can be a distraction. So we'll be talking about invitations today and how every one of us have a responsibility to be an inviter. And I, and I think I think a lot of us like titles. Oh, I'm a prophet. I'm a teacher. I'm a pastor. I'm an apostle. Uh, all this stuff. But the truth is, one of the greatest titles he could have is I'm just a servant that invites people to know the king. And if you, if you come really good at inviting people, there's nothing you can't accomplish. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for, I'm, I'm thankful for everybody that's here. You love them so much. And some of them know that and some don't. But I thank you, Lord, that you'll introduce yourself to them as a loving father that, that didn't come to judge them, but came to save them, make them whole, set them free, forgive them. I thank you, Lord, for you being here, your presence being here. And there are those that came here with a really bad report from a doctor. And, but I thank you, Lord, that you're a healer. You're bigger, you're bigger than any bad report. There's some of us that came here with loss. That This week was just a big loss. And, but I thank you, Lord, that you healed broken hearts. And Father, restore them even now. Comfort them in their pain and their hurt. There's some of us right now come here hopeless, but I, I thank you, Lord, to leave here, Father, with vision. All the depression will go away. And they say, you know what? This is truly a brand new start. This is exactly what I need. They'll be open to hear what you have to say. Transform our lives as a church today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Say it with me. I am an inviter. The word invitation just means a request to come, participate, to go to a place, to gather. I mean, it's just a request to come. Come with me. That's an invitation. Uh, you can invite people to a birthday party. You can invite people to church. You can invite people to go to lunch with you, go to dinner with you. You can invite a girl on a date. Uh, every one of those invitations make you feel wanted. There's something special about an invitation. It makes you feel like, oh, you want me in your presence. And, and there's a lot of people that haven't been invited to anything for a really long period of time, and they're out there. And they're just waiting for you to invite them and include them in your life. And, and as we as believers need to invite people into our lives. We don't want to be uh, exclusive. That means that it's, it's us four and no more. You want to always be able to include people that aren't in your circle. Bring them into your circle. God doesn't give you an apartment or a house to be a lonely person just sitting there with no conversation, no people. Uh, I remember when we first started this church, we were inviting, I mean, we were constantly inviting complete strangers into our homes. And, and I, I remember uh, Pastor Robert lived right downtown San Bernardino, and, and, and Veronica, his wife, would freak out because almost every day, Pastor Robert was bringing home homeless people off the streets and having them take showers in his shower. I remember bringing homeless people from the streets, and some of them, uh, I mean, they, they really smelled, and I would invite them to dinner, and they would eat lunch with our family, and, and some of them would actually pee themselves right at the dinner table. Um, they couldn't hold their bladder. They were hurting, and we just cleaned up after them, loved them, and this is what happened with some of them. I remember a, a young lady that we invited off the street. She was a chronic homeless person on the streets, and we invited her into our home. She, kind of, she saw herself as one of, uh, an, one of my daughters. She was daughter number six. And, and she would call me. When she would call me, she no longer called me pastor. She called me dad. And we invited her home, and we loved her for years. And today, that young lady gave her life to the Lord, but she's off the street. She's living in Ukaipa now in a home. She got, you know, she got her life back. But she needed a little help. And, and that's why you, we got to be careful that we don't think we're better than others. Because your ministry is in the hurting and in the broken and, and invite them into your life. There's, could it be that you're so focused on getting the attention of those that, that have it and you're ignoring, and they don't want nothing to do with you because they already have it. And you're ignoring the people that don't have it and they would gladly be part of your life. Because true love is not helping people that can help you back. That's just a transaction. True love is helping people that can do nothing for you. And God sees that. But when you do that, God says, I'll pay you back. I'll give you favor. I'll bless you. Because you're, what you did to the least of them, you've done to me. 
So let's invite people into our life. The Bible says, when I, w- when I was naked, you clothed me. When I, was, when I was in prison, you visited me. When I was homeless, you took me in. Inviting people. So let's invite people into our homes. Let's invite people to lunch. Let's invite people to church. Let's invite people to our Bible studies. Let's invite, let's invite people as we're going along. I'm not saying you always have to have a tag along, but let's be careful that we're not so private that we can't do any ministry. I, I, we're just private. I understand that. Have some private time, but don't let your, your life be a private event. See, on the other side of invitations is your destiny. That means you're receiving uh, invitations um, and you're giving invitations. Uh, uh, we must be aware of the invitations that God is making through others each day of your life. That means there's people around you that are actually sent by God to invite you to your next level of living, Maybe they're inviting you to church. They're inviting you to, to their home. They're inviting you to, to do, do something good. They're inviting you. They're inviting you to the Wednesday night service. They're inviting you to a discipleship class. They're inviting you. Be careful. Be aware of those invitations because what you're supposed to do with those invitations is just say yes and follow through. If you say no to a God invitation, by default, you're going to say yes to a demonic invitation. If you're not where you're supposed to be, you'll definitely be where you're not supposed to be. Now I'm gonna give you an example of of Lisa, my wife and I, saying yes to invitations that were brought our way. We would not be here as a couple. We're, We're celebrating 35 years of marriage. 35 years, can you believe it? We got married when we were like 10 years old. It was crazy. Back in the day, they married little kids. Just kidding, just kidding. It's going to go on YouTube now. Pastor got married at 10, and Lisa was older, so she was cradle rocking. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Stop it already. The women always stick up for her. But in, in the, um, she was 20. I was, I was 19. She's a, is older than me. No, no, but, but this is what happened. We, there, was, there was a day that we didn't realize how destiny was tied to an invitation. And she lived in Rialto, and I lived in Fontana, but I was invited to a Bible study in Rialto in a small little home. Um, the living room was real small. I really didn't know these people. They didn't go to our church, but there was a Bible study. And, and Lisa was invited by a friend, and Lisa says yes. She shows up, goes to the Bible study. It's Saturday. This Bible study is Saturday. I'm getting a lot of invitations to different things, a lot of things I could do. But this invitation to this Bible study was the one that God wanted to be at, so I said yes. I didn't know that in that Bible study, I'd meet my wife, the woman of my dreams. And she didn't know she was going to meet the greatest guy in the world. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. You got to be confident once in a while. <laughs> but but, but, but in, that, in that saying yes to that Bible study, there was another invitation. This is what I've learned. When you say yes to the right invitation, you open yourself for next level invitation. And so there was another invitation that was made and the invitation after, after the Bible study was given, it was an opportunity to give your life to Jesus, receive forgiveness of sins, receive a brand new beginning and receive the gift of eternal life. And Lisa got that invitation. She showed the, up for the first invitation and then she walked up. There wasn't a long aisle. We were in the living room. It was a very small living room, but she took her four feet and she stood in the front. And she gave her life to Jesus in that Bible study. And I remember that day she was crying. She got filled with the Holy Spirit. She was radically born again because someone invited her. But this is the next invitation she got next level because one invitation will lead to another invitation. Don't expect next level living when you're saying no to the invitations that God has given you. The next level was my mother told Lisa that she, just, she, Lisa just gave her life to the Lord. My mother told her, why don't you come over my house and I'm going to start training you and teaching you the Bible. And you know what she said? Yes. Now, when she said yes, I'm a 19-year-old young man and I seen this fine looking girl coming to my house. <laughs> Green eyes. She was like the list, right, that I had. You have your own list. I have my list. So she came, and, uh, and she keeps coming over my house. It's not a lot of conversation between me and her because my mom's training her. But I started seeing that she was consistent. She kept saying yes. She kept showing up. And, and little by little, I started finding interest in her. 
Now the next invitation came. I invited her on a date. And you know what she said? Yes. Good job, Lisa. That was a good yes. So we start going, we start now, we're, we become, then I, I ask her, will you be my girlfriend? And you know what she said? Yes. <laughs> She's just yesing yourself to victory. It's going, it's going good. But this is how you get to your destiny. She kept saying yes. And then one day I ask her, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. There's no other woman on earth I'd love to do that with. Will you be my wife? And she said yes. Now we've been married for 35 years, and she's, we've yesed each other. We, she said yes a 10,000 times to dates, to good times that we're having. And every time she's saying yes to a God invitation, she's moving into greater destiny. God is saying, say yes to me. I'm going to give you more than you could ever imagine. She was just saying yes to a little Bible study. You're just saying yes to calling the church today. But God has a bigger yes for you in your future. My friend, I'm going to give you another example. My friend, he invited me one day to, invited me to go car shopping with him. I love cars. I've always loved cars. When I was a little boy, I used to play with Hot Wheels for hours. I'm literally, I'd play eight hours with Hot Wheels by myself, and I didn't want no other kids to play with me because they didn't know how to play with the cars. They're like, crash them, and I'm like, no, you don't crash them, you have to take care of them. You have to wax these little Hot Wheels. And that's how I train, I, I, I so I played for hours. I, I got so bad that I wouldn't even, I'd go in the bathroom by my, on myself as a five-year-old boy because I didn't want to, like, leave the cars. So now that's how much I love cars. That's how obsessed I am, right? So, so now uh, my friend, he says, I'm looking for a car. I want to go to a Nissan dealership, Fontana Nissan. It was, it was, in, the, it was in the 80s. And, and I said, i love to. Let's go. Let's go shop for cars. I wasn't ready to buy a car. I don't think he was either. He probably thought he did, but I think he had bad credit. So we show up there. He picks a car out and test drives it. And I'm saying, man, this is exciting. Looking at all the new cars and bells and whistles. And I'm excited about the cars. Um, at the end, he can't qualify for a car. But this is what happened. By the end, I qualified for a job. And I started a 14-year career by just saying yes to support my friend. Just be careful what you're saying no to or what you're saying yes to because it can be tied to your destiny. Isn't that wonderful? Well, I'm going to give you one more example. My mother, uh, she's in the, she living in the Virgin Islands. She just graduated from um, the University of Puerto Rico. She's a young teacher in a Catholic school in the Virgin Islands. And this young girl in her 20s travels, says yes to a missionary trip. To, to, uh, she goes by herself, really, to the Virgin Islands, goes to a place she, know, no, she doesn't know anybody. She's completely out of her comfort zone. And she goes to this island near Puerto Rico, and she starts knocking on doors and inviting people to come to church because that night she was going to speak. One of the doors that she knocked on, and I don't know how many doors she knocked on that didn't accept the invitation, but I'm so glad that she kept knocking on the doors because finally there was a door. My mom was behind that door. Of course, that was before I was born. And she invited my mama. She says, will you come tonight? I'm speaking at the church, and I would love for you to come. And my mother came not because she wanted God or she wanted to, she wanted to know more about Jesus. She came because she was like, Looking at this little Mexican girl, she says, what could that little girl have to say? I got to see this. So she just went like if it was a circus. I got to see this. Well, that girl, that little girl, when she preached, she preached with fire. By the time my mom was done hearing her speak, so the girl gave my, my mom another invitation for her to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. My mother came running up, crying, gave her life to Jesus, got filled with God's spirit. And because of that, yes. And because of that invitation, we are here today. She kept saying yes. We kept saying yes. And now I'm training my girls to say yes to God. That song that you just heard, When We Pray, God gave my daughter Allegra that song. And our team here has built that song. We're believing that song is going to go throughout the world. But my mom was saying yes. Come on. That young lady, that Mexican young lady, missionary was saying yes. She didn't know that it would turn into a ministry that's going to reach eventually millions of people. And we're still saying yes to Jesus Christ. That's me and Lisa with our four, four girls. One of them's even missing. 
Man, we're, look at us. I look the same. What's going on? I'm just kidding. My, my sight's not that good, but <laughs> you guys are awesome. So one of the major ways we serve God is through inviting people. Say it with me. One of the major ways we, invite, we serve God is by what? Now, it's the same way. One of the major ways you serve the, the devil is by inviting people. <laughs> you invite people, hey, come on over. Hey, let's go to the strip club. Hey, let's get high. Hey, let's go rob that person. Hey. Right? There's a lot of ungodly invitations that are happening. To, yesterday I was talking to a guy, and, 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 um, and in the conversation, some guy comes up to him, and he goes this, I'll see you tomorrow. It's Sunday. He goes, I'll see you tomorrow. And I go, I go I'm nosy. See you tomorrow where? What are we going to do? And he goes, oh, he invited me to go surfing. So because he invited the guy to go surfing, this morning, I guarantee you, they were over there near Newport. That's where we were. And he is surfing. Now, he could have maybe been in church if someone invited him to church. But there is a problem. This is what the stats say. Only 2% of believers actually invite non-believers to church. The other 98% of believers only come to church to be entertained, but they don't come to actually get God's mission in their heart, and they're not inviters. This is what God is saying about our church. We are going to be inviters. He said, where are we going to put them? Don't worry, worry, worry about that. Just bring them. We got a whole bunch of extra rooms around here. We'll have overflows on top of the roof if we have to. I mean, we'll expand somehow. We'll have to buy the property across here, but we'll find a way to fit them because I understand this, that God is saying that the harvest is right, but the inviters are few. So one of the major ways we serve God is through inviting. In Luke 14, 16, Jesus replied with this story. So Jesus would actually exemplify and teach through a lot of stories. And there's spiritual principles in the stories, and this is one of the stories. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. So there's a man, this is a story, he he prepared a great feast and maybe prepared all year long for this feast. It's not like he went to Costco and bought everything. Back in those days to prepare a feast, that means you had to to raise the cow, right? (laughs) And then you you had to slaughter the cow they, and you can't, and, and you got to prepare, you got to prepare. Everything they had was painstaking. It took a lot of work. Finally, maybe a year preparation, he finally says everything's ready and he starts sending invitations. Now this represents God and God is making invitations right now. This is that moment that people, me and you are receiving invitations to serve God, to live for him, to go to heaven, God is making the invitations now. Now, who comes? They are those. Who gets eternal life? Who is saved? Who gets set free? Gets set free. Who is forgiven? Those that hear the invitation and accept it. Now, when you get an invitation, you could RSVP, no, I'm not going to be there. Or you could say, I'll be there. This is the moment. You determine how the rest of your life is going to be. Jesus is making the invitation right now. He said, follow me. Come the way you are. I prepared something better than you could ever imagine. At this banquet is greater than you could ever imagine. The life I have is a rich and abundant life. If you'll just say yes to me, you don't have a clue what you're saying yes to. You just said yes to Bible study, but you are actually saying yes to destiny. You are saying yes to a church. You are saying yes to five girls that are living for God. You are saying yes to prosperity. You are saying yes to health. God is saying on the other side of this yes, It's your destiny. It's your purpose. It's your feast. When the bank was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests to come to the bank. The bank was ready. When the bank was ready, he sent his servant. He sent his servants to invite. We're the servants in this story. Where do I fit in this story? We're the servants that are inviting people. Now, when we're inviting people, not everyone will accept our invitation, but don't stop inviting Don't let their no or their excuses deter you from your mission. There's going to be people that say no, but I know. But there is also going to be people that will say yes if you don't give up. Some people make excuses. And we just need to be careful that that we're not letting those excuses cause us to get discouraged. In Luke 14, 18, it says this, but they all began making excuses. Now, this story also could be for someone here 
that when God is knocking at your heart's door and he's inviting you to serve him, to live for him, to be forgiven and have the life that you've really been looking for, are you going to make excuses or are you going to say, okay, yes. So, but they all began to make excuses. One said, I have just bought a field and must expect, inspect it. Please excuse me. So he said, I bought something. I bought this house inspections on that day. So I'm sorry. I know you prepared painstakingly for this wonderful banquet, but I'm going to have to deny it because inspecting my home is way more valuable than your invitation. Now in verse 19, another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Now there's a farmer that just bought five oxen and he goes, I'm going to try these things out. There's nothing wrong with having a house. There's nothing wrong with having property. There's nothing wrong with having cars. There's nothing wrong with having nice things or nothing wrong with having a business. But there is a problem when you use your business and you use your things as an excuse that you have no time for God. Amen. Buy toys. You know, if you, if you want quads, go quad yourself to death. I don't, I don't know what I'm saying, but... You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Get some wave runners and stuff. But don't do it on Sunday morning when you're supposed to be in church. Don't use the blessings that God has given you as your excuse for not. If God's blessed you, praise God. Bless, but bless, but prioritize. Put him first. You know, if you have a nice low rider car, take care of it. But don't go to every low rider event on Sunday. Right? Don't make your thing that God has blessed you with your God. And it's okay. Look at this. It says, please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Look at that. So now this one is saying, I ain't coming because I got a wife now, and, and that's my priority. Now, God's not saying that relationships aren't important, but never put your relationships above God. Do you know some people cannot serve God because their relationship is their God? That girl's their God, that guy is their God, and and they're using that relationship as an excuse. Never get married and use your marriage as an excuse not to do ministry. Use this as a reason. Like together, God has brought us together not to be selfish and not just to be happy. God has brought us together for a purpose. And we're going to fulfill that purpose. We are a team. We're a dream team for God. Now, the only way heaven is filled is if we continue to urgently invite people to come. Heaven is filled with invitations that are made on earth. When we stop inviting people, people stop getting saved, set free, healed, born again. Nothing happens when the invitations stop. And that's why the enemy knows he can't stop you from being saved because you're saved already, but he can stop you from being a servant inviter. Don't be so comfortable in church that you come to be entertained, that you love. Man, I love the way Pastor Marco preaches. I'm glad you love the way I preach, but it does me no good and does you no good if you hear it and you don't do nothing with it. I want to see you take this and change your perspective for the rest of your life. I am in, an inviter. I have a responsibility for those that are around me to invite them to the banquet, to invite them to salvation, to invite them to forgiveness, to invite them for new beginnings. They're depressed. They can be set free. They can have the joy of the Lord. But if I don't invite them, they'll never come. So now in Luke 14, 21, the servant returned. And told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, so he said, these people are all making excuses. But the master said, go quickly into the streets. Go in the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. What he was saying is, maybe those people are too well to do and they've forgotten who gave them the blessing that they have. That's why most of the time, we're way more effective in reaching people in a bad neighborhood than a good neighborhood. It's not that the good neighborhood doesn't need Jesus. They don't think they do. Could it be that your riches are your greatest curse? It's not money that is evil. It's the love of it that makes it evil. And understand, be careful that you start saying you're self-made. Because understand this, you could get sick one day to the next. There's a lot of things out of your control. Thank God for your blessing, but don't get prideful about it. Because real man and woman, real, I think to be a real man and woman is to acknowledge, I need God. 
Because I've learned this. If you're, you well, you use God as a crutch. Well, what do you use for a crutch? I, I, I'll tell you this. I need a crutch. I, I, I need to lean on him. I am not enough. Me by myself, I'm crazy. I ruin my family. I ruin my marriage. I ruin everything. I need God to lean on. Come on. I need his help. I need his wisdom. I need his strength to live. I never want to get to the point that I'm so successful where I think I don't need God anymore. Be careful. Your job is not your God. Thank God for your job. But God is your provider. So he says, well, let's, what you need to do is go to people that would be happy to be invited. Go to the poor. You know, we, when we go into the hood of the hoods of the hood, we don't run into atheists. There's nobody atheist in the hood. Everybody believes in the devil because they, they, they experience him. And everybody believes in God. I need him. So our greatest success is going to the poor, going to the crippled, going to the broken. The people that everybody else has thrown away, the least of them, God says, what you've done to the least of them, you've done to me. Every church in America can be full. Every car seat, come on, in your, in your car, I mean, you come by yourself in your car. Every one of those seats, you got three extra seats, they can be filled if you go get the poor, the crippled, and the lame. They'll come. When we started this church... We invited, we invited the hood. We invited a lot of homeless people. We invited the gangsters. We invited the prostitutes. We invited, and you know what happened? They came. They have not been invited to nothing. Their families don't even invite them to the get-togethers anymore. But there's a group of people that haven't forgot where they came from. You got to be careful. Well, they talk so dirty. Remember, you were nasty too. Just because you got saved, don't forget the nastiness you came from. Don't forget the filth that God delivered you from. Don't forget that you were alcoholic. Don't forget that you were a conniver. Don't forget you were a liar, a hustler, a criminal. Don't, for, don't forget that you were an adulterer. But it was Jesus that intervened in your life. And now, don't forget that. And now, don't think that you're too good to talk to a sinner out there that needs Jesus. Come on. Someone reach you. Go out there and reach them. Invite them to the party. Invite them to hope. Invite them to freedom. Invite them to healing. Go quickly. And after the servant had done this, after the servant had what? The report, he reported there was still room for more. So the master said, go out into the country lanes. Now, now we're going to country and behind the hedges and, and urge everyone, compel them to come. To, to, everywhere, urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. God wants every church in America full. God wants heaven full. But it only happens when servants go out there under the, under the command of the Lord. Go out there and invite them. Go in the highways and the byways. Go in the country lanes. Look behind the hedges. Invite them to come. And so my house will be full. Right now is invitation time. But there's going to be a time that the invitations are over. And when you die, you can't make one more invitation. Are you still with me? Inviting others was practiced throughout the Bible. This is the evangelistic method that was consistently used in the Bible. An invitation to come. It's all about word of mouth. I remember uh, when I go on vacation, uh, I, a lot of times on vacation I'll find a church to visit. Amen. And the reason I do that, I just want to make sure that I'm not taking a, a vacation from God. I want to like keep worship in the middle of it. It might be just be an hour or two that I spend at a church. Uh, and especially when I have my kids with me, I do all I can to take them so they could understand this is a non-negotiable. We worship. I'm not trying to be religious. I want to have values. And what you value, you sacrifice for. I, I believe. I, uh, no, it's not. You're not going to pass on your beliefs. You're going to pass on your values. And the values is what you do. So, so we would do that, and, and I remember we took a vacation in Palm Springs, not very far from here, and on that Sunday, me and Lisa went to church. And that pastor, we always go to his church, and he goes, he goes man, you always come on vacation, you come to church. We're like, I, we never do that. I go, I do. Right? But after the conversation, we had a conversation, he, he began to tell me something. He goes, now that you're in Palm Springs, there's a place you got to visit in downtown Palm Springs, and they have homemade Pop-Tarts. I never heard of that. 
You're probably going to ask, where is that place? I, go find it yourself. I don't remember this place. But when they, they were so excited about the Pop-Tarts that they got me and Lisa going out to church looking for those Pop-Tarts. Because it was word of mouth. And all we're saying is, be careful that you're not more excited about Pop-Tarts, about the things of the world, than your, your, your Savior, Jesus Christ. Be careful that you're not a better marketer of, of Chick-fil-A or some restaurant than you are, or a hamburger joint that you just found, than you are about your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because He's the answer for this generation. So now, let's look at this practice of by, uh, inviting people. Andrew, one of Jesus' disciples, invited Peter, his brother, to meet Jesus. In John 1, Andrew went to find his brother, Simon, Peter, and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. So the only way Peter came to Jesus is Andrew, his brother, brought him. Some of your friends and relatives will never come to Jesus unless you bring them. You're not here just to serve God. You're here, let me tell you, come to church. You are here to bring people. I know we don't have an empty spot. I think we have a few empty spots there. But that's not, we don't want an empty spot in a 9 o'clock service. We don't want an empty spot in our Wednesday night service. And if we have to break down that wall and put a, a, put a balcony, we'll do whatever it takes. But it's time for us to bring in this harvest. Philip, Philip invited Nathaniel to meet Jesus. In John 1, it says, Philip went to look for Nathaniel. Who has God sent you to look for? And told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And then, Nazareth? Exclaimed San Bernardino? Explained that Nathaniel. Can anything good come, good come out of Nazareth from the Burdu? What? What? From the Dino? What? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. Say it with me. Come and see for yourself. I'm describing it, bro, but you got to come and check it out yourself. You got to come hear the preaching. I, I guarantee you, I didn't want to go to church either, but now when I came, I started understanding. It's changed my life. Look at me. I'm different. I'm not perfect, but I know this. I've grown since I've been there, and I'm telling you, it's good for you too. You got to come check it out. On Wednesday night, they're even going to have hot dogs, brother. I'll buy you a snow cone. Amen. Now, there was a lady, the Samaritan woman, invited her whole village to meet Jesus. And this is a great example that God could use anybody to be an inviter. You don't need a theology degree to be an inviter. I remember, I remember that I went to, I was, a, I was a keynote speaker at a university, a Christian university, that was graduating uh, all these doctors and all this stuff. I was the only one without a degree. But they invited me. Because what we're doing... They want to know how to do. How many understand this? Well, I'm not saying I don't have a college degree, but I don't have no big degree in theology. We've been walking this thing out. And, and I want you to understand this. You don't need a, 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 a doctorate degree in theology to do ministry. What you need is willing. I'm not saying don't get it. All I'm saying, you don't need it. And don't wait until you get it. Say, okay, God, I'm good. now you can use me. God has said, I could use it from the first day that you believe in me. Just, I know the lifestyle you've been in. I'm the one that's going to sanctify your name. I'm the one that's going to give you credit. I'm the one that's going to Bless your invitation. So this lady, her name, they call her a Samaritan woman. She don't even have a name in Scripture. She has a name in life. But this woman was an outcast in her, in her, in her hood, in her village. And she was considered um, as, as a woman that was with all kinds of men. I don't know what you call those people. But we're not going to say those names here in church. But, but the idea is she had five husbands. The lady she was living, the guy he, she was living with was not her husband. And Jesus knew all that. Because Jesus told her, go get your husband. Uh, she, uh, she goes, I know. I know you've had five husbands, and the one you're living with right now ain't even your husband. And she goes, well, how'd you know that? Right? Because I know everything. But she wasn't judging her. He was letting her, I know, and I'm talking to you still. See, then people know, and they don't want to talk to you. But me and you are having conversation. And what he was saying, baby, you're thirsty. I can see your thirst. But if you will drink of this well, if you'll drink from me, you'll never thirst again. See, those things that those men can't satisfy you. And you think if the next man comes and he just treats me right, I'll be whole. No relationship, no man, no amount of money, no car, no house can make you whole. There's only one name that you could call him to be truly satisfied and experience contentment and his name is Jesus Christ. If you believe that just give the Lord a little hand. If you believe that. So after this conversation 
this woman that nobody wants to do nothing with, she's actually getting water at noontime. And it just means that all the other ladies will get water in the morning or in late afternoon when it wasn't so hot. But she has to go at noontime because no woman wants to be associated with her. But Jesus meets her and Jesus wants to be associated with her. The woman left her water. So after this conversation, the woman left her water. She said, forget about the water jar. Beside the well and ran back to the village. Telling everybody. Say it with me. Telling everybody. What did she say to everybody? Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So after the invitation to come and see, so the people came streaming from the village to see him. And this is what happened in that village because a woman that just had one encounter with Jesus, she didn't even go to church yet, but she had a call and she had an experience. She had a witness. She went back to her neighborhood and started inviting everyone that she could see. And those people because of this invitation came streaming from their village to meet Jesus and when they heard Jesus they said this we believed we were believing because of her but now we believe because we've heard it ourselves and they all became believers a woman that just had one experience with God became a servant inviter and really we see her as one of the greatest evangelists in the Bible I love this Matthew Matthew um other night named from his Levi, made a feast and invited all of his friends to meet Jesus. In Luke 5, 29, it says, Later Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as a guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with him. So Matthew had a Jesus party. So he, he had a party to introduce people to Jesus. You got to be creative about this stuff. Maybe you need to have a taco party. God, we're gonna, God, we're gonna, or maybe we're going to have some ribs. Like I cook some mean ribs. So on Tuesday night, I want all my friends, invite them to get ribs. But it's not about ribs. You got an ulterior motive. You're going to close every one of them. You're going to tell them all about Jesus. And how are you going to sneak it in? Right before they eat the tacos. So I just want to pray, bro. You pray? Yeah, yeah, let me tell you something. Let me tell you my story. This is how it goes, right? And this is your time to share your testimony. It's your time to share Jesus. And, and understand, they could eat, but make sure you bring some spiritual food too. It, it might just be just sharing a quick testimony. It might just be that prayer. But understand, have a Jesus party like Matthew did. He invited all of his gangster friends. They came and they heard Jesus. And I believe many of them became believers. Now it's our turn to be the inviters. Say, say with me, it's my turn. It was prophesied that there would be a generation of inviters. That's crazy. 700 years before um, Jesus came on earth, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, prophesied that there would be a generation that would be inviters. And look what it says here. Isaiah 2, 3, it says, People from many places will go there and say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of God, of the God of Jacob. Then God will teach us his way of living, and we will follow him. His teaching... His teaching, the Lord's message will begin in Jerusalem on Mount Zion and will go out to all the world. This is, sounds like the Great Commission, that they would preach in Jerusalem, in Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. It was talking about a generation that would say, hey, come to church with me. Let's hear what God has to say. Let's learn from him. And because of that invitation, the Bible says many made a decision to follow him. But understand, no one is ever going to follow Jesus without any invitations. Say it with me, I'm an, I'm an inviter. The Holy Spirit's in partnership with, with the bride or the church, every one of us. We are the ones that make the invitation. Now, now, God's Spirit needs you to make an invitation. If you make the invitation, God will touch them. God will convict them. But if you never make the invitation, I, I remember uh, this, this happened to me the other day. I go to, I go to claim jumpers, and I, I go to claim jumpers, and, and after I... After I finish eating, I walk outside, and while, when I'm walking outside, I see a young couple. They're probably around, they're, they're in their teens. They're sitting there, and, and I hear the Holy Spirit partnership tell me, invite them. They were walking out. And I just turn around. They don't know me. I don't know them. You were there. We were there. It's for real. It's for reals. So then I told and this is what I said, 
Do you guys go to church? That was it. They go, oh, we, we go once in a while, this and that. I go, okay, well, let's talk. So we started talking. It was crazy, right? The Spirit of God hit in front of claim jumpers. I asked the girl, I invite her now to prayer. She's getting delivered with a crowd of people around her right there crying, bawling, getting set free in the front of claim jumpers. A crowd is surrounded. Remember that crowd was surrounded. They're like, people are like, they're at their family get together and they're seeing some, a young girl getting set free and delivered under the power of God because, come on, I made an invitation. And if I don't make the invitation, the Holy Spirit will show up anywhere there's an invitation. This is a partnership. Look at the scripture. Look at the scripture. It says, Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride. Now the bride, this is, 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 this, is what it means. this is how it kind of is. Jesus is the groom, his church is the bride. He's just saying this is a marriage. It's not that you're, if you're a guy, you're a girl. It's not saying that. It's just saying that this is how God looks at it. It's like a marriage. He's the groom and we're the bride. But he says, they work together and this is what the spirit and the bride say. They say, come, let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires to drink freely from the water of life, come. This is what it means. The world's thirsty. And, and all it means is they're hungry and they're not satisfied. The devil knows people are thirsty and hungry for change, for wholeness, for contentment, for peace. And as long as you're thirsty and hungry, you can't rest. You can't sleep. You're searching, and what happens when we're thirsty and hungry, and we don't go to the right source, we go to the wrong sources, because the devil will offer you drinks and food from his table. But the problem is no matter what you drink, and no matter what you eat from that table, it leaves you hungry, it leaves you thirsty, it leaves you depressed, it leaves you addicted, it leaves you worse than it found you. Satan doesn't feed you without poison. Yes, it might taste good going down, but it's going to be bitter in your stomach. It's going to destroy your life. Some of us have been going with our thirst and our hunger to drug dealers, to, to strip clubs, to porn sites, to all kinds of affairs and drinking and all these things, or your business, you're thinking, man, if I just think, there's nothing wrong with getting a great business and doing it for God, but be careful that you're trying to find your wholeness and your identity and your next level of digits in your bank account. None of that. You, it, it, the truth is, no matter how much money you have, you still want a little bit more. You see people that have, like, cars, and I love cars, and I'd be one of these people, I'm sure, because... You'll see them with a, with a garage, and then they'll build a big warehouse, and they'll put 50 cars in there, but they still got to go after 51. Because when I get 51, ooh, that's going to complete the collection. I was looking at a show. I was looking at a show the other day, Sell in Manhattan. And, and they, were, they were selling a $20 million flat penthouse in, in New York. $20 million penthouse. Right? They were selling it, and then they got an offer, but the offer was to lease it for $150,000 a month. If you think your rent is high. And they found out it was Bad Bunny. And he has a place that he just bought in Florida, but he goes, I'm not complete. I guarantee you, if I could get that penthouse in New York City, I'd be on top of the world. Spending 150000 trying to quench his thirst. And no matter what you try, I, mean, I know you don't have 150000 to blow every single month, but you might have $10, you might have $20, you might have $400, but I need to, you're not going to find your peace at the casino. You're not going to find your peace in a bag of weed. You're not going to find your peace in a club. You're not going to find your peace with a girl and an extra amount of fare in a hotel. You're going to find your peace and the wholeness in Jesus Christ alone. I'm going to end it with a video. This is a video of Will Smith. They just interviewed him. And he found out something. That when you have all the money to buy anything you've ever wanted to buy and you bought it, he testifies that you're still not happy. He goes, I've done it. 
bought the houses, the cars, whatever I wanted. I did it all. And I'll tell you this, none of it makes you happy. There's only one place to find true happiness, and there's only one person that could quench that thirst and that emptiness in your soul. It's Jesus Christ. I'm not offering you religion. I'm letting you know this is real. Give your life to Jesus. Take a look at this film, this little clip. What's your relationship like with money? You know, the first half of my life was gather, gather, gather. Mm -hmm. And the second half of my life is going to be, you know, give, give, give. give. Uh, but what, what happens is you just realize um, none of it can make you happy. And, you know, once you've bought everything you want, and there's literally nothing on earth else that you want to buy, you, you, you know, I just wish that was a gift that everybody could have because there's, there's nothing that material can do to satisfy you. When you realize that no relationship, that no money, that no kids, no, that like there's literally nothing that can make you happy. That happy is an internal, full frontal contact with your dark night of the soul and you reconcile that you gotta make happy in here. You gotta make happy in here with none of that stuff. Mm. Now, Will, that's just a recent interview, but Will, I'm not, Will is not, he's not serving God yet, but he's at least found out that his answer isn't out there. It's in here. Unless on the inside you're made whole, you're never going to be complete. You're always going to be thirsty. And you'll start thinking, what I need is to get rid of her or get rid of him or get rid of this or move from, move from here to there. But you're really chasing after vanity there's only one person that could call on to save you his name is Jesus Christ and how do you come to Jesus just like any one of the disciples came you just come check it out come and see everything you're looking for is in this relationship with Jesus I'm telling you I've never heard of anybody give their life to Jesus and regret it I've only heard people say why didn't I do that earlier like I would love to talk to Will Smith and break the gospel down Totally. You know what the worst thing is? Is to think you're a Christian and you're not. Think you got it and you don't. It's a total surrender. How do you, what do you surrender? Yourself. What does God want from me? You. I want you. I want a relationship with you. I'm knocking on your heart's door. Knock, knock, knock. Can you feel it? Like God's speaking to you. He loves you. Even though he knows everything about you. There's a lot of people that know everything about you and they don't like you anymore. But God knows everything about you and he sends his son to die for you. That's how much he loves you. I never want you to doubt that Jesus loves you. You might not even believe that right now, but there's nobody that's more down for you than Jesus. He gave his life for you. Some of you have had friends that were, they claimed to be down until you got in trouble and they forgot about you. I, I, I was talking to uh, one of the ex-gangsters in our church and he was talking about his friend that's done 32 years in prison. And he did it because he didn't rat out his friend that actually killed the person. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. Now, this guy that, that, that he didn't rat out was a big drug dealer in the city making all kinds of money. And when, he, when his friend gave up his life and spent 30, he spent, he's still in prison, 32 years in prison, the guy completely forgot about him and didn't send him a penny to put on his books. All I'm saying, people that claim to be down with you aren't that down with you when you get in trouble. They'll be with you, you got money. They'll be with you when everything's okay. But let you fall and let you fail and let you be down. They ain't got nothing to give. You'll see who really loves you. And when it's all said and done, after everybody leaves you, there's Jesus reaching out to you. Son, I love you. Son, I got a life purpose for you. I'll forgive you. Come on, let's start over. I have a great life for you. I'll set you free. It's your choice now. Let's end it with this. He's knocking at your heart's door. Invitations being made. And he's saying, I want to have a relationship with you. Will you let me in? And it's up to you. You can start making excuses. Not today. I need to go to Taco Bell. Not today. I got to, not today. I got to just one more, one more night out with my, with my mistress. You know, whatever. 
But understand this, you could die in that transaction. The devil wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Give the devil one more shot and you might never have another shot. And I guarantee you, no matter how pleasurable that thing is, I guarantee it's going to leave you more empty than you could ever imagine. God's trying to save you from your future self. He's saying, I know the pain and suffering, the destiny the devil has for you, and I have a plan for your life for good and not evil, that you'd have a hope and a future. Above all, I wish that you prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. Soul prosperity leads to life prosperity and health. Stop expecting to have a healthy marriage and a healthy family when you're not healthy spiritually. You're fooling yourself. Well, I'm going to get better. You ain't going to get better. You can't get better. You need to get healed. You need to get set free. You need to get saved. Promises without Jesus are unkept. Okay, now let's end it with this. I'm going to ask a real serious question. I ask this all over the place. I said, if today were your last day on earth, because it could be, we just had a young man that was here church Wednesday, and he's gone. They found him dead in his room this week. He didn't know. He only had a few days to live, but he's gone. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. We had, we had Larry just a few months ago washing his car, gets a heart attack. I just spent time with him two days earlier. He's gone for eternity. You just never know, young, older. There's one thing for sure, your life is very delicate. One second you be here, next you gone. Or not only that, one second you're here, the next second you ruin your life. I'm proud of you. It takes a real man to do this. Proud of you, man. You know, you know what I, I like about this? He goes, I already know. <laughs> I already know you're going to call. I ain't waiting for the call. I'm coming. I'm proud of you. And you know what? You're breaking the ice for somebody here. Come on. You're breaking the ice for somebody. God is using you today. I want to get baptized. I want to get baptized. Amen. Here we go. Let's keep going. The Holy Spirit saying, get baptized. He goes, I want to get baptized. How I many know what God's doing? Come sign up. Boom. Come on, let's the next invitation. Boom. Next invitation. Boom. It's going to happen. Okay. If you want to join him, everybody stand up now. You say, man, I, I'm not sure where to die right now. I go to heaven. I, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I'm thirsty. I'm broken. I'm empty. As a matter of fact, I feel like giving up. Who does Jesus call? Thirsty. People that want to give up and they're tired and sinners. If you're one of those categories, today's your day to get saved. Proud of you, man. God bless. God bless. What's your name? Albert? Robert. Robert. My, like my brother, Robert. Love you, man. Let's give Robert a hand. Come on, we got some men coming up here. We got some men coming up here. Come on. Saying, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to start. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. One. Two, three. Raise your hands all over this building. I want to give my life to you. Don't hesitate. Today's your day. Today's your day. Surrender your life to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. Come forward. Come forward. Invite. Ask your neighbor. You want to go up there or go up there with you. They're an invitation away. If you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to be forgiven of your sins, you're, you're coming with your thirst. You're coming with your addiction. You're coming with your pain. You're coming with your misery. Give your life to Jesus. Come on. Come on up. This is your moment. This is your day. Jesus is knocking at your heart's door. Don't be an excuse maker. Make your decision. Decision. Don't make excuses today. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. I guarantee you, this is the best thing you'll ever do in your life. Jesus loves you. He wants to forgive you. He's saying, when I'm going to give you, money can't buy. Money can't buy the peace I'm going to give you. Money can't buy the forgiveness I'm going to give you. The money can't buy the relationships I'm going to give you. Money can't buy, come on, the eternal life I'm going to give you. Come on, let's give them a hand as they're coming forward. Come on, let's give them a hand as they're coming forward. They're coming. Ask your neighbor. Come on, invite them. Come on up. Let's go. Love you, baby. For sure. For sure. Awesome. Anybody else? Give your life to Jesus. I'm going to take one more second. Because there's still some out there. You came. You got to make a decision. Don't get to the point that you care more about what people think than doing what's right. There's going to be a day you stand before God. Don't play Russian roulette with your life. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. Let's give her a hand as she's coming before. Come on. Let's give her a hand. That's awesome. Come on. This is your day. Let's give her a hand for coming forward. Come on. They're still coming. They're still coming. There's someone out there right now. 
I'm telling you, this is the greatest opportunity of your life. Give your life to Jesus. I want, I want you to get this. If you're not saved and you continue living in your life of sin, doing what you want to do, that's all it means. This is what's going to happen. The price for sin is misery. This is what happens. You get little pleasure and then you reap a whole bunch of misery, depression, anxiety, emptiness, unworthiness in your life, sorrow. Now you get in that cycle with all that sorrow and that pain, then you try to numb your pain. Then you add an addiction or you add drink into it and now it turns into even greater problems. Misery. No man could fix you. No woman could fix you. No drug could fix you. No, no material thing could fix you. Only Jesus can make you whole. Number two, if you keep on living in your sin, you move into addiction. And some of us have different addictions. Some of us have addictions that are very secret. Lifestyles, mindsets. And you need, right now, you need freedom. Jesus will set you free. Number three, if you continue in your sin, you'll end up, the consequence, the ultimate consequence is a second death. It's a lake of fire for eternity. You'll wake up one day in hell with no way out. That's why Jesus came to die for you. Because there was no other way for you to be saved than for him to pay the price for our sins. He paid the price. He had to die. An innocent for the guilty. You, me, me and you did the crime. He paid the bail. He paid the price. And unless you place your faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes on, online. No one comes to the Father but through me, Jesus said. There's only one way to heaven. It's put your faith in Jesus Christ. But you're not going to do this privately. You're going to have to do it publicly. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I was doing all kinds of sin publicly. Jesus died publicly. This is your day. God loves you. I'm fighting for your soul today. One more. You say, Pastor, that's me. I feel like God's talking to my heart. I know you're not giving up because, I'm going to tell you why I'm not giving up because I love you. God loves you. I'm going to count the three one more time. Say, Pastor, that's me. I want forgiveness to my sins. I want a brand new start. It takes a real man or woman to stand up. One, when I say three, raise your hands. I want to be forgiven. I want a new start. Two, and when I say three, quickly raise your hands. One, two, three, raise your hands. Come on, come on, come on. Proud of you. Proud of you over there. Anybody else? Come on. Anybody else over here? Awesome. I see all these hands here. Those that raise their hand in this second call, come forward real quick. Come forward. It takes a real man. Come on. He's coming. Come on. He's coming right here. Let's give him a hand. Come on. Let's give him a hand as he's coming. Come on. We're safe. Souls are being saved today. Proud of you. Proud of you. New beginnings. Freedom. Come on, church. Let's never, let, ne let's never take this for granted. What's your name? Let me shake your hand. What's your name? Jacob. God bless you, Jacob. And who's this? His son. Hey, Jacob. D Jacob, this is being you, Jacob. And you, Jacob. This is being real men here. Your dad, he's, he gave his life to the Lord. And now he said, come on, son, we're going to do this together. These are, this is a real warrior. You're going to have a brand new, come on, it's going to be brand new. I know your daddy loves you, but get ready for the best part of your life for both of you. Come on, let's give a hand for a son and a father giving their lives to Jesus today. That's a, come on, we need more men like that. Come on. Praise God. Come on, ladies. Fight for your kids, single moms. So I don't have a husband. Don't worry about that. You bring your kids to church. You fight for your kids. You'll be an example. And God will raise them up. Come on. Through you. All right. Let's pray. All right. There we go. Together. Let's, together. Praise the Lord. There's still more. Okay. How many we got here? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51. Let's give the Lord a hand. Come on. Come on. You know, you know why I count every one of you? Because you, you matter to us. You count, okay? All right, we have a goal that 1,200 souls get saved at this campus. 
we are ready with this, which was 51. We're, huh? We're at 422. We're one third there already. Come on. And we got three more weeks to go. Let's, let's do this. Wednesday night, let's pray. Let's pray. And also, remember, this Saturday at 9 o'clock, we're going to go and reach our community. Adopt them. Like, come here, and we're just going to knock on a few doors. No scary stuff. We're not going to ask you stuff you can't do. We're going to do this, and we're going to lovingly invite people, and we're going to do what the Samaritan woman did, and people are going to come. Amen? Let's pray. Everybody here, bow your heads, close your eyes, and pray with me. Say, Jesus, I thank you for loving me so much that you've invited me into a relationship with you. I'm officially saying yes. Jesus, I will follow you. I'm done with my sin. I'm done with leading my life. Take over. Make me new. I know there's a price to pay for sin. And you love me so much that you paid the price. You suffered. You died. And you rose from the dead. Today, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. And I will get baptized to show everybody that my old life is gone. And I'm starting a new life as a follower of Jesus Christ for the rest of my life. Fill me now with your spirit. Make me a new person. Set me free from all addictions, from all demons from depression, from anxiety, from cycles of destruction. I am done. Who the sun sets free is really free. I'm saved and I receive the free gift of eternal life. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand.